I'm very pleased to introduce Anish Chopra, discussing his new book, Innovative State. Anish Chopra served under President Obama as our nation's first chief technology officer from 2009 to 2012, before which he was Secretary of Technology in the state of Virginia. Most recently, he is co-founder and executive vice president of Hunch Analytics, a new technology firm focused on improving the economy through the use of data analytics. Tonight, he'll be presenting his new book, Innovative State, in which he outlines the ways that 21st century technologies can be used to reshape government. Ariana Huffington calls it must-reading for anyone interested in tackling America's biggest problems. And Walter Isaacson writes, with inspiring stories and clear insights, Chopra provides a playbook for open innovations that work in both the public and the private sector. We're very pleased to bring him to Harvard Bookstore tonight. Please join me in welcoming Anish Chopra. Uh, one bit of housekeeping. I want to uh, announce there are two friends of mine in the room who served with me in the Obama administration. And I want to just uh, thank them up front for their service. So I want to thank an old friend of mine from near childhood, Nishit Acharya, who's here now advising the folks at Northeastern University on tech transfer. Led a lot of our economic development strategy for President Obama. And my former and still current Deputy Chief Technology Officer at the White House, Harvard's own Nick Sinai. So how many, of, how many of you believe that government can be a force for good? Let's just baseline the room tonight. Are we in a reasonably happy place? Okay, we're in a happy place. Uh, what I'd like to do is to set the stage for three key takeaways. One, it is my hope that you're going to feel hopeful about the future. Okay, so start with that proposition, hopeful. Second, I want to provide context for why I'm hopeful by discussing periods in American history where we've had a pioneering government. And then last but certainly not least, I'd like to leave you with something tangible that you can use as a citizen, as an entrepreneur, as a member of the nonprofit ecosystem, as a university staff member, whatever your role is in America, there is something that you might do to play a participatory role in a more innovative state. Now that Put a pause on what that means, because this is about active government, not passive. So we'll put a pause on that. So if we're all hopeful, how do we explain this? The website that didn't quite work, uh, I, I, I took a screenshot of the most poignant aspect of the failure of healthcare.gov. And I used this to start the conversation because I wanted to say, as I do in the book, that government doesn't work. That's the attack. That's the message. That's what we've been hearing. And a lot of it has to do with not only the literal but the figurative sentence that's at the center of the page. The system is down at the moment. Now that is a technical statement that the particular application wasn't quite up to speed, but it was a generalized statement about the country and the sense that we can't get the right and the left together to agree that the sky is blue on this gorgeous Cambridge day. So if in fact we are starting from the proposition that government doesn't work or there's so much evidence to suggest challenge after challenge, what is it that gives us hope? Well, from my vantage point, it's America's very long history running a pioneering government. A good friend who helped me think through the history of our country in the context of this book. Come on in, please. Welcome. There's a few seats here. Uh, Michael Lind, a professor, uh, sorry, a, a leader of a think tank in Washington, D.C., the New America Foundation. Michael wrote a wonderful book. So, yes, I would love you to buy mine, but I'd also encourage you to take a look at Michael's uh, Land of Promise, where he catalogs just generation after generation of innovations coming from the public sector. Let me just share one. In the 1870 census, we had seen an influx of immigrants. And with the influx and the current technology, i.e. paper counting, it was estimated that the census would take 14 years to be completed. First time it would have taken longer than the 10 years in between censuses to run. Now the challenge at the time was there wasn't a lot of external expertise on this, on this given challenge. So a government employee, an employee in the Census Bureau, 
thought through the ideas of a tabulating machine to start the automation process. And it was so successful, it spun out of the Census Bureau and along with other technologies formed the basis of? IBM. Thank you. That's right, IBM. IBM, one of the absolute symbols of international innovation, had its orange, or, or, orient, uh, its or, uh, initial uh, origins, thank you for that, uh, as a government spin-off. At least part of it, right? Not all of it, a portion of it. And there are many others. The other piece of news is that the agenda to reform government and modernize it actually isn't partisan. We celebrate reinventing government, for those of you who recall the Clinton administration. But note that many of its origins started in Bush 41. I don't know what you officially call him, but whatever, Bush 41. So from the period of time in the late 80s through uh, the 90s, there has, and continues to this day, been a focus and a commitment on modernization. But, and this is the important point, the successes associated with reinventing government were largely successes of management reform, not technological innovation. And why do I bring that to your attention? The same day that President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore stood in the uh, White House to announce the Reinventing Government Initiative. It was September of 1993. And what do we know about September of 1993? Not a lot of websites. In fact, only about 200 of them at the time. No mobile broadband, uh, no cloud computing, no big data analytics. These technologies have largely been impacting the private sector for the last 20 plus years. So the divergence we've seen between the era of a pioneering government and a government that works and the current struggles of the system is down has largely been defined by these last several decades where that pace of technological innovation in the private sector had exceeded. And in many ways, at root cause, the inability of government to keep pace with the adoption of said technologies. So, Part of what I was asked to do by President Obama was to think about ways the government could close this gap. Now, I reported directly to President Obama when he created the position. His thesis was, on any given topic, pretty much, there isn't an opportunity to solve that problem without a role, minor or major, for technology, data, or innovation to do something meaningful. And rather than have that expertise sit in each and every one of our policy silos, the healthcare expert, an energy expert, an education expert, that he'd have an advisor in the White House whose role was to cross cut each of those policy areas to ensure they are injected with a proper understanding of the possibilities and potential for the application of these new technologies. That was the model we adopted inside the administration. And to answer his question, what is it that we could do to close the technology gap? I thought to grab lessons from industry examples that might give light, shine light on what we could or should be doing, or at least avoiding, as we took on this responsibility. And I turned no further than the story of Kodak Corporation to draw lessons on what not to do. And to, in fact, learn what it is that one could have done differently had we been at Kodak decades ago. Now you might be wondering why am I showing this image of Kodak and Instagram? It was a particularly awkward time for me in this context. Uh, we were entering the 2012 State of the Union. First Lady Michelle Obama has a box, which is sort of prime time viewing, right? It's where all the celebrity guests come. So we had invited Mike Krieger, the co-founder of Instagram, to join as the First Lady's guest. Anybody want to know why was Mike Krieger invited, by the way, to the White House? Does anyone know the story of Mike Krieger? What was so cool about Mike Krieger? Yeah, okay. Tell me. Uh, I have no idea. I'm asking you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike Krieger uh, is a Brazilian immigrant. And the reason is the president's re uh, commitment to immigration reform, acknowledging that immigrants can be job creators and entrepreneurs and innovators, and Mike representing that story 
Only later would we learn ultimately selling his company for a billion dollars uh, to Facebook. But it was ironic because it was the same year Kodak announced it was going bankrupt. Now what is it about the Kodak story that draw any lessons? Kodak was a very inventive company. It simply struggled on innovation. Invention is the idea creation process. Kodak invented the VCR. But Kodak did not believe that any of us would pay $500 to buy one. They hadn't talked to Vinit, who's obviously an early adopter of most technologies, so he would have been a wonderful test case. But they chose not to commercialize. Kodak invented digital photography, but chose not to commercialize it on perception that it would cannibalize their core business. In the 70s and 80s, they had 90 plus percent market share in the film business and had a sense, as the researchers would suggest, that they didn't really have much in the way of competition and therefore not much in the way of motivation to keep pushing that innovation pipeline. The big lesson is what the team at Wharton wrote, when new technologies change the world, some companies are caught off guard. Others see change coming and are able to adapt in time. And then there are companies like Kodak, which saw the future, parentheses, and invented some of it, and simply couldn't figure out what to do. The big lesson for me was if we thought about an, an, an innovation management pipeline, we could bring new ideas, there's lots of ideas in this country, into actual products and services that could deliver better government for the American people. An innovation pipeline. How would we create this innovation pipeline and what were the lessons we could learn that had relevant applicability in the public sector? For answering these questions, I turned to three other companies. And forgive me if the imagery is hard to read because I realize the screen's small. So don't worry about the details. We'll leave the slides for anyone to review afterwards. I'll figure out a place to post them. Uh, I spoke earlier at the Kennedy School. That's a public domain. We'll make sure we get the word out uh, that they'll have the slides available. Or maybe you can post them here. Maybe if you have the ability. Whatever. We'll figure it out. But the three places that I thought to, to learn on how to build that innovation pipeline drew from pretty successful private sector best practices. The first from Procter and Gamble, whose CEO famously proclaimed that 50% of all new products and services sold through Procter and Gamble would be ideas that originated outside of Procter and Gamble. Valuing the outside as much as the talented team inside. This fit the philosophy for President Obama which had always been about the talent that's widely dispersed throughout our country. That while we have a Washington entrusted to make decisions to solve national problems, that we have largely the challenge to tap the expertise of the American people. So the idea of a cultural commitment, a, a management culture focused from the top that values external ideas, we had a clear winner in the president's vision. So I introduced President Obama to Bruce Brown, the chief technology officer of Procter & Gamble, who shared a tangible example of how this came to be. They make diapers. If you know anything about their pipeline, their portfolio. And uh, by the way, my other former deputy, Aman Bandari, is with us. Hello, Aman. I gave everyone a shout out, so thank you for joining. Thank you for coming on time. The, uh, let's make fun of Aman. Hey, Aman. OK. Bruce Brown shared with the president that they struggled in finding ways to improve the production process for diapers. And they turned to an idea out of the military, and more specifically, the Department of Energy, on the modeling and simulation tools they use to remove nuclear dust from the shop floor. Very sensitive stuff, this nuclear dust. So you have to be really precise about it. Turns out you have to be really precise about the water absorbing pellets that are in the base of the diaper to collect the goods that might be deposited in said area. And the president learned the story that Procter & Gamble improved cash flow by over a billion dollars having ingested or incorporated this external innovation, in this case from the pioneering government, 
to help make its diaper production line more effective and efficient. Second insight, Jeff Bezos. Am I allowed to say his name in a bookstore? <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon actually designed two very interesting, uh, empowering tools to tap into the expertise of frontline workers. So in the case of Amazon, if you're a customer service rep and you receive complaints on a given product that you feel fit a pattern that means the product is inherently unsafe, those frontline workers have the authority to pull an andon cord, borrowing from the Japanese Toyota production process, that allows them to remove that item from the catalog, the lifeblood of the revenue stream at Amazon, removed because a frontline worker had a hunch that the product was unsafe. The managers had no say in the removal and couldn't put the product back into the queue unless they had fully investigated the accusations or the concerns. That's pretty empowering. And that again filled the philosophy for President Obama that with a three million federal workers we have to have talent in the front lines that we should tap into uh, to solve big problems. The second aspect of what uh, Jeff Bezos did is a little more funny. He would award these Nike shoes to employees. They call it the Just Do It Award. And the, pre the premise had been that uh, if you're an employee who tried a new idea, even if that idea didn't succeed, and frankly, even if you didn't get permission from your boss, you could get honored with one of these sneakers. So I took this second principle of tapping into the expertise of frontline workers from Amazon. And then to round out the lessons learned, I shared the stage with Sheryl Sandberg, the Chief Operating Officer at Facebook, where she shared a statistic that blew my mind on the subject of job creation. She had shared at that venue that while Facebook has about 2,500 employees at the time, this was a couple years back, she had done a search on the internet for jobs that were given the title Facebook developer. Anybody want to know how many people have the title Facebook developer? Aman? 500. That would be a good guess as a share of the 2,500 inside the walls of Facebook. But she asked the question, Facebook developer outside the four walls. Correct answer, 30,000. Scratch the brain a little. 30,000 people have a job title associated with Facebook developer. Only 2,500 people on payroll. A and B don't compute. The answer, Facebook opened up its developer platform. So if Nike wanted to build a Nike app on Facebook, it would hire a Facebook developer to build on top of the APIs. What economists and, and um, experts in the field would call a force multiplier effect. In fact, one of my inspiring uh, mentors for this uh, vision, uh, Professor Henry Chesborough at UC Berkeley, uh, talks about force multiplier as one of the most powerful weapons in innovation. It is the ironic and exciting opportunity for a platform to get someone else to put their mind, money, and creativity on making your platform better. Nike's decision to build a Facebook app, if that is intending what they, what they intend to do, adds to the, the value of the platform itself. From here, I took the assumption that while, again, we have three million federal workers, we are a nation of 300 million people. If that same ratio holds, Facebook developer externally to internally, we could have tens of millions of Americans co-creating new products and services to help people live better lives. We just have to open up our government to facilitate this. So all three of these case studies led to an, a management agenda which we called the Open Innovators Toolkit. One of my responsibilities for President Obama was to, uh, on the day I was leaving, uh, I actually left to run for office in Virginia. That was not a, I came in, I got the silver medal. Uh, very proud to have gotten the silver medal. But 
the president asked me, could you codify uh, a lot of these principles on paper? You know, we've been doing a lot of things and you'll hear some stories momentarily. Could you share a bit more about how we can replicate and build upon this culture? So we uh, drafted and shared an open innovators toolkit. And the entire premise of my book, if you believe the history and you're hopeful for our future and you want to know what you can do about it, I want you to leave with just two words, handshakes and handoffs. That's the formula, handshakes and handoffs. It turns out that Washington actually agrees, is willing to shake hands on implementing these open innovation tools. We have the legal authority, the permission, in many cases the funding necessary to then hand off to us, the American people, the opportunity to participate and to help develop better products and services. You see, the key to an innovative state is not just putting more people into the government that really get it and put the box on some kind of newer technological platform and have it work on its own. The key to an innovative state is that that box opens up and invites us to plug in and to contribute our ideas, our code, our, our approaches so that the services that we all need to live better lives work better. Hopefully cheaper, definitely faster. So what are the tools on which we're seeing these handshakes? There are four of them and I'd like to share a word on each and then I'll wrap for questions and comments. First, Governments can open up the data they already collect and encourage its use. Explain to people that we have information that you can use to help build new products and services to help people live better lives. Second, I call this government with a lowercase g. We can do a better job of convening public, private, nonprofit stakeholders to sit around the table together to find ways to lower barriers to entry and expand opportunities for new ideas to scale into these innovations the way we wished companies like Kodak and others had facilitated as they took new ideas from lab to the market. Third, it is also the case that when we look to solve problems in this country we think that you have to be specialized in that one area. In fact, many of the best solutions to problems come from folks who don't wake up in the morning and go to bed at night thinking of that problem. In fact, it may often be the case that the outside view, the fresh set of eyes, a wider lens of participation might invoke uh, ideas that make a difference. And so prizes, challenges, and competition become an important policy. And last but certainly not least, let's embrace this notion of entrepreneurship inside the government by bringing external expertise and internal expertise on teams that can actually operate like a lean government startup to unclog those broken arteries in the departments that need the help most. A word on each and then we can have a conversation. Each of these tools are rooted in history and I'd like to share the history before I share the tool. I'm a Virginian and for us history starts with Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson was a bit of a weather nut. In addition to his duties writing the Declaration of Independence, he would collect twice a day the weather and share it with his network of weather enthusiasts. More to the point, when Mr. Jefferson became President Jefferson, he directed Lewis and Clark to explore the West, but asked them to collect data on the climate, on the surroundings, to be made freely available to the American people upon their return. Jefferson was an open data enthusiast. And that spirit of Jefferson lives today in the Department of Commerce's National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I would ask the question, how many of you check the weather every day? Presumably. And I'm, I'm guessing you're checking it on your smartphone, 
in the newspaper, on television. How many of you check the weather by visiting weather.gov? Make the record show, not a single hand has gone up. Weather is a multi-billion dollar competitive industry. It's a five plus billion dollar competitive industry. But you know what makes weather an exciting industry? It is almost entirely powered by a common data asset. You see, it's our government, you and I, who fund satellites that orbit the Earth and sensors that monitor and collect information that then is made freely available to any of these competitor sources to turn into information that we consume and use. A competitive market built on the foundations of a more open and innovative data resource. And more to the point of the book, it's the reuse of the data that is the key policy lever here. It's understandable that we should have a conversation about where should weather.gov invest and where should it not and when should weather.com take over, right? Big policy debate. How far up the chain should weather.gov go and when should weather.com take the handoff and take it to the last mile? Far more interesting though is the creativity of the team at Climate Corporation whose goal is to deal with climate change. Pretty important topic in our lifetimes. And they thought that a, a product they could bring to market would be effectively a climate change crop insurance product. And to build this product, they took the same data, weather data, combined it with other open data, and used their data scientist expertise to build these new insurance products. This team of less than 50 people was so successful that the Monsanto Corporation paid a billion dollars for their ideas. The point is, we take a lesson from the page at NOAA that data, funded, uh, data collected by and organized by, funded by the government, if made freely available with no intellectual property constraint and at very low to no marginal cost to access, could fuel unlimited products and services that McKinsey has put a price tag on. The McKinsey and Company analyzed regulated sectors of the global economy, healthcare, energy, education, transportation, and so forth, and found that if we as a society opened up more data and allowed for their use, not just government data, but private data, we can boost productivity many, many uh, points, five to six percent, and we can unlock three to five trillion dollars of economic value. For example, if someone can build a personal tutor that will close the achievement gap for the kids in Cambridge who still struggle on education to reach the math and science milestones to be successful in our economy, but along the way, like Weather Channel and others, makes money, we would say thank you for your success and encourage others to join. If a nonprofit wishes to help patients route to the right care setting at the right time for the right uh, level of service, we would say thank you if they route patients to get the right care, cutting costs 30%, dramatically improving outcomes. These are the possibilities through open data. Second, I didn't think I'd find myself celebrating Herbert Hoover, but in fact, he gave us a roadmap in this second attribute of an open innovation toolkit. Hoover was in a conundrum. His political bias was that government should not intervene in the market. Yet after World War I, when he inherited the job Secretary of Commerce, he did not like sitting by watching the American aircraft manufacturing industry plummet. We had the Wright brothers, but at the end of World War I, we were losers on aircraft manufacturing. Other countries around the world had governments propping up competitive airline manufacturers. Industrial policy, picking winners and losers, not Hoover's way. He thought 
laissez-faire wasn't working, but was totally uncomfortable with top-down government picking winners and losers. Henceforth, his vision of an associative state, the role of government convening stakeholders in an industry, identifying areas of common problem, Godfather, thank you for coming, my former professor at the Kennedy School, me here to sigh, as well as, if you haven't taken his courses, you must. If he's got to open them up, you got to have a MOOC. We can have, I'll have a part of it. Um, uh, decides that if we've got to find a way to get consensus in the industry, what are the pre-competitive challenges that we can tackle together as an associative state? It turns out that in airline manufacturing, if we had a bit more knowledge on the engineering of airfoils and engine cowlings, we could build a stronger, more vibrant American aircraft industry. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what happened. You can't see the picture. This is Hoover ascending to the presidency, thanking the team at NACA, the predecessor to NASA, who solved these engineering challenges and saw them commercialized in then popular DC-3 and Boeing 247 designs. These competitors, like weather.com and weather channel and weather whatever, had a root, common root, in the airfoils and cowlings designed by NACA. In the internet era, that means common standards to liberate information with privacy protections to the consumer. We've now made it policy that every American patient is entitled to an electronic copy of his or her medical record without cost, constraint, or other barrier. Anyone here ask for your blue button file, by the way? Raise your hand if you've asked for your blue button file. Uh, from a hospital system, or a doctor, or both? Um, from, a health plan. from a health plan. God bless you. Did they support your blue button request? Yes. Excellent. That means uh, you'll see these little icons pop up. A voluntary industry collaborative where 500 organizations have pledged to honor a patient's right to safely and securely download their medications data or health data. And as a patient who downloads this data, if you choose to share it with another entity, maybe your doctor, maybe your online assistant, maybe your loved one who prints a copy and puts it in the filing cabinet, it's your data and we've encouraged the industry to adopt a common standard so that this service can be made ubiquitously available. In the same vein, we've asked the utility industry under Nick Sinai's leadership to allow for a green button so that you can download an electronic copy of your energy usage data. Any of you NSTAR customers? Has NSTAR provided for you your green button data yet? If they haven't, they certainly will. And they will because uh, about 70 some odd million Americans are now supported by utilities who voluntarily pledge to do this. Now you might say, why on earth would I do this? A 63-year-old grandmother in San Diego accessed her green button data, not because she wanted to read the data, she handed it off to a Facebook game where she played with her neighbors to see who could save the most money on their energy bill without living uncomfortably. In San Diego in August, I think it's kind of hot in San Diego in August, 30% savings on her energy bill. And the same is true with education. Schools, K-12, higher ed, allowing students to download safely and securely their education data using the, we, didn't, we, ran, we ran out of colors, so that one was called the My Data Initiative. So we got blue, we got green, we got the My Data, and you'll learn about the, I don't know if we're calling it gold, we gotta come up with a color, but the financial data, what are we calling the, that, is that gold? Get transcript? The, it, we're calling it get transcript. So if any of you uh, wanna access your, your, your IRS forms, you wanna download a safe, secure copy of the filing that you just made, uh, you can now access your data. They're calling it get transcript because I guess buttons aren't cool. So, Standards lower barriers to entry and encourage competitive markets. Third lever. Here I couldn't find a Jefferson or a Hoover in the US economy. We had to go way back to the UK and to talk about the 1707 Skilly Naval disaster. 1400 sailors died, 
because they couldn't determine longitude. Now, the Mihir Desai of that era was a genius by the name of Sir Isaac Newton. And the country turned to Sir Isaac Newton and said, Sir Isaac Newton, any chance you could help us fix this problem of longitude? Because you are, in fact, Sir Isaac Newton. You can do no wrong, etc., etc. Uh, unfortunately, Isaac Newton couldn't solve the problem. So the UK government turned to a novel concept, the idea of a prize, awarding 20,000 pounds to anyone who could help solve the problem of determining longitude. Enter Harrison, a watchmaker, not high on the list of likely innovators to solve the problem, ultimately designed the chronometer, which solved the issue for generations. Today's Harrison is Victor Garcia. Victor Garcia came to this country as a Mexican immigrant. He waited tables at Sizzler. He saw an ad that said he could design an automobile if he went to a technical institute, and he ultimately found himself working as an entry-level contract worker at Peterbilt, trucking. Didn't have health insurance, wife gets pregnant, needs to make money finds out that DARPA, the research and development arm of the military, which brought us GPS, which brought us the internet, is trying to solve a manufacturing conundrum inside the military. We have a terrible circumstance. The cost of a unit, the unit cost of a combat aircraft is rising exponentially. The budget for the department is rising in a linear fashion. Norm Augustine, formerly of the Defense Department and now just Puba made a very funny comment in the 1980s that at the rate at which we were building aircraft, by the year 2054, one combat aircraft would be the entirety of the DOD budget. And it would have to be shared by the Air Force, Marines, Army, and Navy. He was joking. The Economist in 2012 decided to take that joke for a ride, plotted the cost of each of our combat aircraft. We are absolutely on target with the current Joint stri Strike Fighter. So we need to break this. So the DARPA team said, we need a dramatically new approach. Why don't we crowdsource the design of a combat support vehicle and prove the American people have the capacity to solve problems. So they put out a three-week competition awarding $7,500 to anybody that could solve the problem of designing a combat support vehicle capable of medevacking 200 soldiers. To my, mind you, it takes three weeks to add a comma to a DOD procurement. <laughs> Yet they found Victor Garcia, who outperformed 20,000 other potential contestants. They turned his idea into a working prototype, and it was one of my proudest days to pick up the phone and call DARPA. Can Victor and the team make their way to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, because President Barack Obama wanted to say thank you. We have Victor and Victoria Garcias in every single corner of the country. They might even be here in Cambridge. And the opportunity to invite their talents in to solve problems, mind-blowing. Fourth and last lever before I wrap up my remarks, the story of a lean government startup. I went back to Presidents Wilson and Roosevelt who initiated a program called the Dollar a Year Men, inviting experts in the private sector to work for the government hand in hand with some of the best and the brightest inside government to solve very specific problems. In World War II, it was beefing up the industrial supply chain so we could make uh, the weaponry necessary to win World War II. The quip and the joke is you see Roosevelt here shaking hands with the former CEO of GM, Knudsen, uh, it turns out that pretty much all of the dollar a year men Republicans and none of them voted for Roosevelt. But they all responded to his call to serve. And they often quipped, why are there no Democrats amongst you? And Knudsen responds to Roosevelt, none of them would take a dollar a year salary or something to that effect. The humor notwithstanding, the principles were clear. The mindset in that era was, are you good enough for government? If you remember the Kennedy administration, are you good enough for government? We're bringing back that sentiment with the launch of Presidential Innovation Fellows. Entrepreneurs 
in the public, private, nonprofit sectors who found creative ways to use the latest technologies to solve problems are dedicating six months to a year of their life to join hands with the best and the brightest inside government to solve meaningful problems in a relatively fast, agile, nimble way. One of my favorite stories is the story of RFP EZ. Procurement is broken, happy to talk about it. This team said, we're going to create a separate platform to allow agencies to find folks who can help build websites for under $150,000. To run an experiment, they put up a working prototype and they took five federal agencies who requested website development support services through the existing fedbizops.gov website, the traditional channel of procurement. Yes, it's called FedBizOps. That's the official name. And they put the same five through RFP EZ. And as you might imagine, hundreds of people participated in RFP EZ that had never done business with the government before. Prices fell across all five by 30% and the quality exceeded expectations. So I end by revisiting healthcare.gov. You saw me talk of its challenges. I'd like to revisit its benefits and successes. Not the version that went live in July of 2013. That had trouble. I want to go back to July of 2010. Did any of you visit healthcare.gov in July of 2010? Anyone? Anyone know it existed? You did. How did you know it existed? It was, uh, I was in a gap between jobs and I was just really trying to figure out health insurance. And Perfect! What I was going to do. God bless you. Was it helpful? Yeah. Yes, it was helpful. Unsolicited. A little, yeah. <laughs> a little. It was something. The, re the, reason why it's, the, the reason why she's qualifying it, which is the right thing to say, is we have a busted individual insurance market before the Affordable Care Act. They could deny you care. They could surcharge you based on your medical conditions. So Congress said, before we kick in the new law for the existing busted system, let's create the largest public and private catalog of all insurance options. So at least we have the list of all the options, good or bad. And we should disclose that list in a searchable website not unlike Expedia.com. The reason it embodies the spirit of an innovative government is it began with a tweet. Ed Mullen is a Ju uh, designer in New Jersey who was frustrated at the debate on health care reform. At the heat of the debate in January of 2010, he says if the American people could see the exchange, they might like the exchange and want it passed. So he does on his own, designs myhealth.gov, takes a picture of the, screen, of the screen shot that he designed, and tweets it to my colleague at the White House, Macon Phillips, who sees it and says, that's pretty good. The, the bill was signed in March. By July, the site had to be live. There was no time for a big procurement. So we assembled a world-class team, my successor, Todd Park, my colleague Megan Phillips, and they recruited people like Ed Mullen to join an internal team that had to be fed with two pizzas, so it was a small team, and they hit the ground running all day and all night. They built a wonderful catalog, so much so that the president was comfortable being the first sitting president to absolutely demonstrate a website. He actually has a website on, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, whitehouse.gov video archives, you can see him demoing the healthcare.gov site that this young lady had a chance to peruse. But more importantly, we opened it up. Like the weather data, we didn't care if people found it on healthcare.gov. We wanted the data out. So US News and World Report, among others, to this day consumes that data feed and has populated a brand new website that they call the Health Insurance Finder. To this day, they've invested their capital, their marketing, their creativity on top of the underlying data that had never been collected before. And I don't know if you saw it on the Health Insurance Finder or actually healthcare.gov, but the point is the data should find you. You shouldn't have to go find the data. And that last mile may be a nonprofit, maybe a for profit, maybe the government, but it's all of us working together. That's the attributes of an innovative state. Why am I so hopeful? Because of this concluding slide. It doesn't appear that these handshakes are controversial. 
Republican Senator Moran, Democratic Senator Mark Warner, co-patroned the Jobs Act that's now been signed into law, opening up this spirit of innovation by allowing entrepreneurs to raise capital and to go uh, live their dreams. Democratic Tulsi Gabbard, Republican Aaron Schock, leading a coalition of members of Congress who are 40 of them under the age of 40, launching the Congressional Future Caucus, committing to a more open and transparent democracy powered by open data, and yes, the Majority Leader Eric Cantor, holding hands with his colleague Daryl Issa to celebrate a vision the President has championed around open data. I kid you not, I share you the tweet that demonstrates their support. The Data Act a few weeks back passes unanimously in the House, unanimously in the Senate. The future is less about left versus right in an innovative state and more about the degree to which we are open rather than closed. And success in an innovative state is not marked by some amazingly cool tech team in Washington, by our capacity to work hand in glove with that same capability to deliver better services for our friends and neighbors. I'm hopeful because this is our future. Thank you so much. The question is about how do we uh, modernize or innovate around the elections process so that we have a more vibrant democracy on the election side. Um, I actually share that sentiment. Uh, I was announced yesterday as uh, uh, one of the advisors to a new open source collaborative to open up elections technology so we can increase citizen participation. You can tell from my ethnicity. Thank you for that. Trust the vote. If you anyone follow, trust the vote. Uh, I have heritage in India. Just finished uh, an election. Uh, Mayor, what was the final tally on number of voters? 600 million? 600 million? Even more exciting, how many newly registered voters in this cycle? Over 100 million, if I'm not mistaken? Newly registered? So we've got to find ways to modernize. Uh, six hour wait times to a vote is not consistent with the spirit of participation. So let me say I stipulate that. But let me make one slight friendly amendment. We have ideological opposition on climate change. Full disclosure, I believe climate change is real and I'd like us to socialize the cost of carbon and redeploy those resources to fund and subsidize uh, renewable sources of energy to help my kids, grandkids, and the next generation. Not everyone shares my view yeah. and that's okay. Why? While we want to solve political hegemony on price on carbon, how many of you know that there's a billion dollar hidden tax against solar panel installation in this country? Who's in favor of a billion dollar hidden tax against the solar panel installation industry? It turns out permitting, financing, and other quote unquote soft costs which are controllable, not the science or physics of converting the sun into energy, but rather the implementation process, which in Germany, you're from Turkey, in Germany, benchmarked against the US, they don't have the billion dollar hidden tax. What if both sides of the aisle agreed that we should do whatever we can to streamline the permitting process, get to same day permitting, and to get as much as, clo as closely as we can to this magic number of a dollar a watt installed? Wow, what if what if we tap the creativity of the American people to join hands to find ways to root out those costs? I wonder if there could be a prize competition, say for $10 million, that would reward the team, the mayor, the installation team, the labor union, the manufacturer, to work collaboratively to install solar panels at a dollar watt. That would be interesting. And it would have been announced three years ago. It's called the Race to the Rooftops competition and it's live right now. How many of you know about the Race to the Rooftops competition? So here's the point. We haven't settled the political debate on a price on carbon. But over the past three years, it's pretty much settled that nobody likes a billion dollar hidden tax against the solar industry. So if we understood the handshake, the prize authority, the funding, the competition, the tools, all there. The handshake has been made, sir. 
it needs the handoff. And if in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we don't have a team working on this problem, going after the $10 million prize, we have a problem. But the hope is that we spread the word, that we have this architecture of participation. So we have taken out the billion dollars over the three years, and now we've reduced the cost to install solar, we've upticked the uh, share of renewable energy sources in the overall mix, and we move on to the next opportunity. There's so much opportunity in health and energy and education where there are handshakes. So this is a very fundamental conundrum. Elections are governed by states and the local election officials. And so we have a circumstance, like I'm in Virginia, where we have very clear policies from the other side of the aisle that wants to suppress. They don't call it that. They say it's for other reasons, fraud or whatever the bugaboo is. Yet in Virginia, we had a 2013 election overturned on the fact that we didn't do a good job on open data. What happened? Electronic optical scanning machines throughout the voting process that still require manual counting. In the Attorney General's race, one machine was neglected to be counted. And that one machine flipped the vote. A Republican was deemed the winner on election night. And on Twitter, the crowd said something doesn't make sense. That precinct normally votes Democratic and it looks like it's skewed a lot more. Something might have happened based on history that doesn't quite look right. So even though the elections had been counted, certified, or moving on, the community started questioning the validity of the data and ultimately discovered that there was this hole such that they, uh, uh, they went back and said, oops, one machine failed to be counted, and that flipped the election to the Democrat. If they had adopted better open reporting technologies, if each source machine broadcast digitally in addition to paper, there could have been a backup check to see the accuracy of the results. Similarly on voter registration, despite states that have um, these bullying tactics, uh, we've opened up the ability for individuals to digitally register, e-voting, e-registration, uh, powered through a series of public-private partnerships, including with Rock the Vote and others. And so we have the capacity to get more folks to enroll, to participate. Eventually you'll see states, like I hope Virginia will, uh, adopt these new check-in tools. So if you can board a plane with your phone, you should be able to check in to your voting machine and vote. Uh, so you don't have to wait six hours. These things are coming and they will improve, reduce the barrier, reduce the friction, increase participation rates, even in the states where they've had these policies like you have to have all these IDs. That's my hope and why I'm hopeful. Yes, sir. So this is a broader question, which is can an agency in its daily operations complement its existing sources of talent with tapping into the crowd? We launched a, a service called challenge.gov which standardizes a platform for every federal agency, uh, up to $50 million if they chose, to advance or resource these kinds of participatory opportunities. And we saw a similar capability in the Haitian earthquake when uh, there was no functioning 911 system on the ground in Haiti. So we created one out of thin air. In fact, my colleague Katie Stanton, who was at the State Department only four days, uh, put together a coalition of tech firms, nonprofits, the military, and essentially uh, Haitians in trouble could text message their concerns, route those through a platform that translated the Haitian Creole to English, dispatched an NGO to their geolocation based on the phone's uh, signal, and the response time was less than 10 minutes to field thousands, tens of thousands of calls. Crowdsourcing information is absolutely proven to be successful. I don't know the CIA project, but it seems like it's in the same spirit. So uh, the question, I was told to repeat the question, is how do we instantiate the training necessary to put these tools into practice? Frankly, that's why I wrote the book. Uh, I went to the Kennedy School, and as much as I love the Kennedy School, uh, I, I went to the gym to work out muscles when I went to the Kennedy School on how to make a bill 
become law on how to make a regulation through cost-benefit analysis, but I never learned how to apply open innovation to solve problems. I'm really hopeful the schools of policy will instantiate some muscle building activity around these policy tools because I didn't have any exposure to them in my training. Second, what we did personally in the office that I uh, came from, the CTO office, and my, my colleagues are here, Aman and, and Nick, who, who uh, served in those offices, uh, we provided interagency training. We, in the Obama administration, established this concept of a CTO who uses tools like these. And over 50 federal agencies, for the first time in many cases, assigned this role to someone. And we would meet on a frequent basis to share best practices, to compare notes. Part of what I did was to write um, blogs on best practices. And in fact, you could follow the logic. I wrote about how Todd Park was amazing, the chief technology officer at HHS, a leading practice. We gave him an award. Surprise, surprise, he's my successor. So you saw that digital trail by looking at the public uh, uh, recognition. Uh, I do hope that uh, you'll see more activity in the uh, formal and informal circles for training, but not just for the government. This is also training uh, in the private sector. It is relevant that when I came to Boston, I should say Cambridge, not only did I want to speak here to the community, I visited my alma mater, the Kennedy School, so that I shared my hope that they'll build a course around this. And then I went to the business school. And I went to the business school because I wanted to have folks understand that if you're the head of growth strategy at Nike, whatever, part of what you want to do is to blend these open resources so that as you provide a service, maybe it's some kind of fuel band app that whatever the next generation is, uh, that gives me advice on how to be healthier, not just on my fuel band, but in my broader sense, in the, se in the sense that it could help uh, sort out whether or not I should go to the emergency room or a clinic and how I might engage the healthcare system. So they can play a phenomenally important role, and that's why I think all stakeholders should be told. That's why I talk about handshakes and handoffs. The handoffs are almost as important as the handshakes. The president in 2009, one, in fact, uh, I will just indulge a little bit of history of love. Um, the first time I was on Air Force One, so it's kind of an exciting time, uh, we flew to unveil the president's strategy on American innovation. Whitehouse.gov slash innovation, you can read it. And it states, in addition to this vision of a more open and innovative culture of problem solving, if you think about it in, a, in the context of a pyramid, this sits on a foundation of 21st century infrastructure which says roadways, railways, and runways are what we thought of as infrastructure, and now increasingly a smart grid, healthcare technologies in the doctor's offices, uh, learning technologies in the schools and at home. These are building blocks of innovation. The next layer above are rules of the road that promote innovation and entrepreneurship. Stronger enforcement of patent rights, brother man, so that we can actually allow the little guy, he's one of the guys who's helping entrepreneurs who are on faculty at one of the schools in town make lots of money for their ideas. That's him. So uh, we want to honor a system that, that allows patenting and invention and rewards that system. That's a rule. We want to make our tax policy uh, really favor and support innovation and entrepreneurship. It, uh, tax credits for R&D, entrepreneurship, angel investment credits and the like. And then, to your point, on the internet economy specifically, we want a fair, open platform. No blocking, no preferences, no inside game versus outside game. We want everyone to have a fair shot. And the core principles of an open internet have been at the bedrock of President Obama's views from prior to running for office to while he was in office to where we are. It's obviously up for debate now how to implement these rules, but the presidential commitment and my support for the president is unwavering. We need robust, open internet rules so that we can ensure that everyone has a fair shot at the internet dream. That's the position. We'll see how this unfolds during rulemaking.
Well, it's sort of a false choice because it's both. In sectors of the economy that are heavily regulated or operated by government, by mathematical definition, it's driving in the context of an innovative state. Uh, schools are run by government, by and large. And if you wanted to improve schools under the principles of an innovative, innovative state, you'd actually be having government drive in that example. Uh, sexting apps on the internet, not so much in the mission of government, but builds on enabling capabilities, enabling rules, enabling technologies. If you document the internet economy and its sub-engineering parts, there are at least 10 elements that are over a billion dollars in value each that have their origins in federal R&D grants. That's enabling. And you don't want to have one or the other. It's all about the problem you're trying to solve. If I want to solve the problem of how do I get teenagers to click more ads, I'm not so sure you want government driving that innovation. Am I happy that some algorithm coming out of the NSF has relevance to some clicking propensity rule on an advertising site? That's enabling. Do we want to fix the American healthcare system by modernizing Medicare? By modernizing the way our schools treat and learn to teach our kids? By building a utility system that's regulated to pump more clean energy? That's driving. So it's an either or based on the problem you're trying to solve circumstance, not one size fits all. That may be a lame punt, but it's my best response. Yeah, you can't put it on that's not 140 characters. <laughs> but you'll have the video up hopefully at some point. We'll tweet the response. Hey, all, thank you so much for coming tonight. I really appreciated you hanging out. I'll sign some books. Let's have some fun.